Hey, and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another session of the Hotelier Pulse Report together with us at Tech Talk Travel. Uh, we've got uh, a great guest joining us today, and let me bring him in. It's Joao Pinto Colo, who is the sales director at Onrio Resorts. Hey, Joao, how are you doing? Are you, Andre? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you. And also joining us is, of course, Mr. Pedro Calaco, who's the CEO of Guest Centrics and Great Hotels of the World. Pedro, great to see you again. How's things? Good, good to good. see you. Good to good. see yeah. you. Things are, you got a smile uh, on I, your face like you're I about to go on holidays. Absolutely. I am about to go on vacation. So good, I think good we to all see you. need it at this stage. Pedro Colaco, good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So let, let's get started. I think, um, you know, we're here to discuss, obviously, the 16th uh, edition of the Hotelier Pulse Report. And we were just saying before we came online, the summer has been a little bit of a strange one for everybody, and especially here in Germany. I was just commenting on how we've had a rather dull, wet and cool summer compared to the last one. And I think uh, uh, the, the, the feeling in the market is a little bit kind of... Um, yeah, maybe disappointed, subdued, not really getting into that summer vibe. I'm sure it's different elsewhere, but Germany's been a bit of a challenge. So, yeah, I think with that now, the summer, obviously with the start of summer, 2021 signaled a wave of restrictions across Europe, which have not only impacted consumer confidence, but also industry's expectations. And I think uh, what this report has particularly shown is hoteliers have adjusted their expectations in terms of revenue for 2021 versus 2020, which is really not a new thing. But I think, again, it perhaps needed to be done more on a frequent basis than, than typically before. So... Let's um, let's get into it. And Pedro, while while I've got you, the report is here. Is there anything you want to kick off uh, before we I go to uh, Joao with anything, or should we go straight to Joao? Let's go to Joao, and then and then I can I can add my my very good, slides. excellent. So Joao, you're on, you're on the hook, my friend. You're on the hook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically, um, Joao, I wanted to kind of ask you the first question that I. I came up with was basically the number of hoteliers that expect revenue in 2021 to outperform 2020 kind of fell sharply according to the last results of the report. Um, from your perspective, how have you predicted the financial recovery for, for golf and tourism? Because I know you guys focus heavily in that area. Um, so how have you fi focused your financial recovery to unfold for the remainder of this year, the remainder of the summer that we have, and then of course beyond? The first thing to say is like now every forecast we've been doing for the last year is wrong. Uh, first, we were doing uh, like a monthly forecast and we got wrong and now weekly forecast also wrong. Um, and then also uh, interesting is last summer, one year ago, we thought this summer would be great. We thought this summer would be close to full occupancy. <laughs> and we are, uh, and we are very far from that. We are. Our hotel has 200 rooms and 40 viewers, and the days that we have, one, <gasps> we celebrate. Uh, so, a very big gap between what we thought last year and what we are feeling right now. Uh, still, a lot of uncertainty in different things. Uh, we one year ago we. We thought the vaccine would save everything. Maybe we forgot the flights are also important or the confidence, etc. So we we are happy to have human beings at the resort <laughs> to see people. Uh, it's true a bit more than last summer, but we thought it would be a lot better, and is not true. Yeah, I think I think that's the sentiment pretty much everywhere at the moment. Uh, I think everyone was really hoping that there would be a, a bit of an upturn. We have seen a positive return, of course. I don't think anyone's saying that that hasn't happened, but I think we were hoping for something a little better. What do you think, Pedro? Yeah, no, this is exactly what we're seeing and also what people are telling us on the report, right? So if you look at, you know, what we, we were having, you know, we were going into the summer with increasing optimist expectations about 2021 being better than 2020. And then I think June hit um, and June was not what people were expecting because there were a lot of travel restrictions put in place. 
in the EU in general. The, first, the Brits put everybody on the amber list. Then Germany selected a few destinations and said they're unsafe to travel to. Then the French did the same thing. Then the Dutch did the same thing. And I think at some stage, and I was talking to friends in, in, the, in the UK, and they said, look, we're just tired. We've booked flights three times. We had to cancel three times. And uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna stay home. We can't deal with this any longer, right? Book, rebook, cancel, get the voucher, get the money, get this, get that. Uh, at some stage, people are, are just starting to say, you know what? I'll postpone this uh, probably to next year, and I'll just stay close to home. And I think that's what happened uh, around Europe, and and that's why we're seeing here this very steep drop in terms of op optimism. Let's put it th this way, uh, of where people think they're going to end up in 2021. Um, if you look a little bit further, right, um, actually people are also a little bit pessimistic about 2022 because we've seen that a lot of people in the June report said 2022 is the place where you're going to go back to 2019. And I think we're having sort of the opposite of what Juan was just mentioning, right? That last year we were very hopeful about this year. And because now this year, you know, we failed expectations. We're not hopeful about 2022 any longer. And people are pushing their expectations out and they're minimizing expectations. I think it's started to be on the safe side, I think. People are just being overly conservative, I think. We, we um, are tired of missing forecasts. Yeah, exactly. I, th I, I think that's it. But if you, if you look at where we are right now, I mean, things are not that bad. There's very few hotels in complete shutdown, you know, comparatively yeah. in the cycle. This is the cycle of the, of the pandemic, right? And the red line is how many hotels are shut down. And we've never had as little hotels shut down right now. It's just that occupancy levels are low. And I think that's driving pessimism uh, yeah. by the hoteliers. I think that's that's really what, what what's happening. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's sort of my, my first take um, on this. Yeah, excellent. Also, also, just before we continue, I just wanted to make sure to remind everybody uh, who's watching and tuned in. First of all, thanks for tuning in. Um, but make sure you download the latest edition of uh, the uh, report. Um, and Melissa will pop the, the link into the chat session. And also, if you're a hotelier, uh, watching, please uh, contribute to the report for next month because obviously the more data that we get, uh, the more rich the report can be. Um, and Melissa will also pop that uh, link into the chat for everybody as well. And of course, please don't hesitate to ask any questions or make any comments. Um, we'd love to love to receive those as well. Um, so I just want to also quickly ask both of you, just on a side note. Now, you know, again, we were talking about the vaccine rollout and. You, I, even though we are getting vaccinated, I think one thing that I've noticed, and, and I'm curious to get your opinion on this, is with these new variants now, it seems as though it, there was a certain element of confidence with the vaccinations. Great, we can get back to normal life. But then all of a sudden, these variants came out that seemed to be more aggressive and, and a little bit tougher to, or easier to, to actually uh, to to catch, but then also harder to, to deal with. Are you getting a sense of that as well? Do you think the variants have perhaps impacted this? Do you think it is down to that? Or do you think it's coming from other factors? Uh, Joao, what I do think, you think? I think um, definitely has some weight, uh, but also very important that's been affecting us big time in a negative way is uh, different rules coming up all the time. And uh, being a safe country next week, you are not a safe country, then you are safe again. Uh, yeah. And so it kind of interrupts the communication. We are safe for G Germans. And then we tell our tour operators, our clients come to Portugal next week. We are not safe. Same for other countries. So it kind of uh, makes it uh, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Pedro, are you seeing that as well with your hotels? Abs absolutely. And I think um, it's uh, what's on the slide, right? I think the market is very volatile. So the, the dotted green line is uh, the number of, 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 of gross uh, bookings. And then the orange line is the cancellations. And we can mm. see that actually there was a big jump in bookings in May, which actually you know declined a little bit in June. But I think the problem with June was were the cancellations. And, and speaking to Juan's point, it's really because, you know, the open, close, the variance, the communication is very unstable. And therefore, people canceled a lot of the bookings because suddenly there, there were travel restrictions in place. And I do believe that obviously the variants have an impact, but I think mostly it's the communication around the variants. And if yeah. people just keep talking about the number of cases and the number of cases, 
and not necessarily about the impact on, on public health of those cases, um, then, then I think people are going to get scared. I have here, um, uh, I, I created a slide actually just a, a few minutes ago, and I call it the UK experiment, right? Because on the 19th of July, the UK did this thing, which a lot of people are considering is crazy, which is they said, you know what, uh, we're going to trust our people, be careful, uh, but you can do whatever you want, uh, uh, you know, with really with no limitations. And that was on the 19th of July, when, and, and they were in the middle of a very big spike of cases in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly enough, there's been a, hu a huge decline in, in cases in the UK in the last week since the Freedom Day, right? So my take on this whole thing is uh, this UK experiment is going to dictate what's going to happen in the rest of Europe. Because I think, you know, citizens are fed up with this COVID thing, right? And they're, you know, and governments are not communicating clearly. The rules are very inconsistent and very incomprehensible, right? For instance, in Portugal, in, um, during the week, you can have dinner um, uh, uh, inside without any tests or certificates. But on the weekend, you have to show a certificate. So the virus, you know, takes off during the weekend. But during the weekend, I mean... These things make yeah. absolutely no sense. So no, I think there's no. just, um, and, and by the way, these sort of rules exist all over Europe, right? Where, you know, rule A doesn't make any sense with rule B. And I think that if the UK experiment goes well, and if we, if we continue to see these, you know, spikes going down and the number of deaths going down and the number of people in hospitals going down, there's going to be tremendous pressure on the, on the European governments to open up, right? Yeah. Because they're going to say, look, the UK was vaccinated before us, but now we're as vaccinated, actually more vaccinated than the UK, right? There's quite a few number of countries now in Europe that are as vaccinated or more vaccinated than the UK. So why don't we do the same thing? And I think that's that's my hope for the future. And that's really what my where my head's at is, okay, we got to move beyond COVID. We got to move to some sort of normalcy. And if we continue to look at the number of cases as the indicator of this uh, uh, this disease, then we're looking at the wrong thing because the virus yeah. is going to be with us for the yeah. next few years, right? So Absolutely. we can't look at the number of cases. We have to choose other indicators. And yeah. here, uh, and, uh, here and, in the reservations department, for example, uh, we notice uh, the conversations uh, at the phone. Uh, instead of uh, talking about uh, the rooms, how the rooms look like, if they have a view or what to do, if the restaurants are good, our reservation colleagues are all the time talking about uh, answering questions about safety or what time the restaurants will close. Do you need a test? Do you, can you go in a car to the, 60, to the city nearby? So it, uh, it's difficult. Yeah. Okay, great. We have a question here as well that's uh, directed towards you, Joel, from Gregor Ramel. Gregor, thanks so much for, for tuning in and for, for the question. And he's asking you if you saw a pickup of U.S. bookings after the EU allowed U.S. travelers to come into Europe. Did you, did you see any uh, dramatic uplift there from your side? Uh, nothing uh, nothing uh, significant. Uh, right. That's quite small. Uh, we notice people are only interested in uh, flexible rates. So we've got some reservations, but we feel that they can, uh, if something happens, they will cancel. So we've got some interest, but nothing relevant in terms of uh, uh, budget. Yeah, okay. All right, great. Now, just coming back to your point about the the, the calls that your receptionists are taking, do you, and it's a te technology related question now for those of us who who are curious about the tech side of it. Do you have actually any chatbots in place that actually can t try to take that load off those those generic questions that are coming through about about those those things, like for example, COVID issues and health issues? Have is if you and if you haven't, is that something that you've thought about perhaps introducing? We are. Uh going to introduce that very soon. Um, what we, what's normally great about that is um, there are some kind of questions, frequent ask questions that is very easy to, to be right. very fast, even if it's after the working times that would answer automatically for people in Asia or United States. At this time, the questions are very kind of, unique and personal mm -hmm. uh, like 
I want to travel with my grandmother. She's uh, uh, 92 years old. So in a chat box would be more, more difficult. Now, yeah. we kind of went back 15 years ago where every booking uh, we have to, to talk. Uh, and we, if we fast forward 15, uh, 13 years, most reservations, they go in without interaction because they can fi find everything about the hotel in uh, TripAdvisor, social media, uh, et cetera, in the websites. And now it went back a long time. So every reservation needs more care, more uh, yeah. conversations, more time. Yeah, yeah. So in, in that sense, what I'm hearing from you basically is, yes, techn technology can help, but it's not really going to solve every problem that you're facing either. True. Yeah, very yeah. true. Okay, great. Um, Pedro, there's a slide here that shows a tale of two worlds, which looks quite interesting. Did you want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, no. So um, because um, Gregor asked about the US and, and US traveling to Europe, and we don't see that uh, coming through yet. But I think um, sort of following up on the vaccination story, uh, what we're seeing here is on the left side, we see, you know, these are based on, on a set of hotels, right, that we, we, we choose as barometers. Uh, how many uh, active check-in nights were for June in 2019, 2020, and 2021? And we see that Europe is trending at about 50% or so of 2019. And if you look at the US, in June, it was very close to 100%. And in July, it was actually over 100%. And, yeah. and the UK is trending towards more the US than Europe. So I think there's really two worlds right now and two, two velocities of, 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 of bookings and stays at hotels and occupancy at hotels, which is, you know, the US is basically COVID is over. The UK is trending towards a pattern of COVID is over and Europe is slowly catching up. So um, my expectation is that we're going to continue vaccinating people over the summer. And then after vaccination is over, that possibly, you know, there's so much demand for pent up demand for travel that, that we're going to see a big, you know, if the weather holds. I think the, the big thing is how's the weather going to be in the fall? If the weather yeah. is going to be good in the fall, we're going to see a lot of travel in the fall. If the weather, you know, just like Germany, if it's, you know, miserable, then possibly not. But uh, but I, I I hope that, you know, St. Peter is going to be on our side and uh, and yeah. uh, and we're going to have a reasonable fall that will make up for the last time um, that we had this year. Yeah, I have to say, I think what the UK has done actually is um, quite a brave brave thing to do uh, because essentially they've literally just said, listen, we're going to open everything up again. Um, we're going to go, go with it over the summer period and see what happens. And I'd be curious if, if anyone in the UK is watching now uh, and you'd like to make a comment about how things are actually there in real time um, or give us your thoughts on how you feel things are going, please do uh, drop some comments into the section and we'll bring them up. Um, but uh, I, I guess We'll really know the outcome of that when winter comes again, I think. Uh, in, and I think that's really the, the litmus test, which is why I said earlier it's a brave thing for the UK to have done because it could work really either way. And, and it's, a, it's a real gamble in this instance, I think. So we'll see. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, just, just coming back to the travel restrictions as well. Um, this, the other question I wanted to kind of put towards you, Joao, was um, as we've kind of already discussed, you know, the, the restrictions have impacted consumer confidence, um, as well as the variants, I think. And in June of, of this year, hotel bookings once again had dipped below pre-pandemic levels. So um, in order, when, when you hear about that, what are some of the strategies that, that you have taken at, at Onria? Um, and what have you implemented to respond to these market disruptions and also to cater to the guest demands that you actually have during these times because i'm sure the demands from the guests may have fluctuated or changed a little bit so how have you navigated that our uh our first uh, impulse would be start crying but normally that doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> and then um we thought we can't force people to book so our strategy has been mainly about communicating a lot of stuff to show that we are alive all the time, to show uh, product improvements that we are doing. We did a big refurbishment at the hotel. 
Actually, we did that in uh, almost nine months in a record time uh, just before the, the lockdown. <laughs> so then we had new rooms waiting almost one year. But we communicated um, massively the room improvement, showing the different types of rooms that were ready. And then we did some big works in the villas that is kind of uh, working very well. Uh, there's a tendency towards uh, this bubble tourism. People seem to like this now. Uh, and then we are doing also other product improvements, sort of uh, solar panels, trying new, also new concepts like the all-inclusive. We've never done that in 20 years of hotels, so we are doing this summer for the first time to uh, test a little bit, doing some events more for popularity of the resort. We are doing some open air concerts, stuff like that, to all the time being communicate, communicating to the client, uh, show what we are doing. Uh, so in a smooth way, show that we are here and hoping the confidence uh, arrives. Uh, and then using all social media uh, to, to show that we are taking safety procedures, doing those videos, showing a check-in with lots of safety concerns, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the bookings, um, mainly is kind of flexible policies in terms of cancellation policies uh, to, to try to make people more confident about the booking. Uh, and we are also aware we are now receiving bookings for tomorrow and after tomorrow instead of two months ahead, like uh, the old times. It's been mainly a big experiment, not taking ourselves so seriously because we are ready to be all the time wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very good way of approaching it, actually, Joe. Yeah. Always be, be ready to, perhaps not wrong, but just always be ready to, be, to, to adjust if you need to adjust. Um, Pedro, before you start on this slide, I just want to bring up the comment from Tracy Scott, who's actually from the UK, and it's kind of uh, really validating what I think we're all feeling. There is a real feeling of we need to return to some sort of normality. People are keen to meet now face to face. I think we're getting tired of virtual uh, meetings and, and masks are definitely uh, still being worn more so as people feel more confident. So uh, I think, yeah, uh, we'll see how things pan out, but I think it's the way we need to move forward. So, okay. so if I can pick up on two things, right? You, you said bookings are down uh, and we're down in June to for the first time, which is sort of true. And the same, actually, July is, is looking like it's going to be a little worse than, than June. And these are the number of gross bookings. So there's actually a big dip in gross bookings. But in terms of net bookings, it's not so bad. And what I would say is while, you know, we see that bookings are a little bit down, they're much higher than they've been through the pandemic, right? So, so I want to put a, a note of optimism here. And, I, and yep. I would like to pick up on two things that Juan said. All inclusive. We are seeing hotels that are running all inclusive programs doing extremely well because of these restrictions that exist in terms of restaurants and doing stuff outside the resort. People that have the resort and the beach or the resort and golf right next to each other are doing very well because there's a certain set of people that say, I'm going to go there, I'm going to stay in the resort. Even if there's nothing open outside, I'm still going to have, you know, a, a reasonable vacation time. So, 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 so we're doing that. So, so I think that that's, that, that's, that's one point that I think is, is interesting to follow is that this all inclusive seems to be doing well this year, at least in, in, in our portfolio. Um, the second thing that, that John said that, that I think is really important is this, this booking pace shortening, right? Which is really unnerving uh, for people that are in operations, right? And for people that are trying to plan ahead and forecasting. But actually, it's working to our advantage in a way that actually we're doing better than expected if you look just at the pickup. So, so I'm still hopeful that August is going to be a reasonable summer, even, is going to be a reasonable month, even though we're going into August with not a lot on the books. So, so I'm hopeful for that. So these are sort mm -hmm. of the things that I, that I would say. 
Excellent. Excellent. Also, just in from Ben Thomas, uh, he who joined us actually last time, which was a great session. Um, ben says that they're seeing a much faster booking pace in their UK hotels, especially for Q4, which follows a similar pattern to the US Q2 and 3. So he says the market seems to be much more buoyant than expected, which is great. Um, yeah. And for the first time since the pandemic began, yeah, that's such great news. Uh, the booking pace in the UK is higher than mainland Europe. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's interesting feedback. So we're getting a few comments coming in, which I think I might just also quickly run through because yeah, they're very, they're very, um, they're very good. Um, Adele Gutman saying from as a, as a traveler, uh, my trust for a company grows when they communicate comprehensively and authentically, which job you've obviously been doing. And you said that that's how you're approaching this. But she also says that the guest reviews confirm that the action and policies are adhered to and guests are still having a great time. So yeah, that's, that's a very true statement. Uh, we also have one here from a LinkedIn user. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see the name. I apologize uh, in advance for that. Um, and they're saying inquiries that they're receiving are off for all resorts with more activities inside the hotels, which actually is an interesting point because one of the questions, Joe, I wanted to ask you was, as golf resorts that you have, how impacted um, have you been by these changing restrictions at the resorts themselves, given the outdoor nature of the of the of the uh, format that you're pro 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 providing, um, have you seen the uptick in demand from there, and 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 what's been the the approach there from in terms of the activity side of things, or is, are you finding that it's pretty much as like everything else? Uh, well, we notice people are very keen to book uh, for uh, resorts because resorts means more space, it means nature, it means non claustrophobic environment. Uh, so in the images that we, we display on social media, etc., we try to show this, that people feel more comfortable when there's more space. Uh, then we have to be a bit more uh, creative, uh, show that we are not just golf, uh, to show that people have a lot of space to, to walk, horse riding. Uh, for example, uh, we have this uh, lake in the middle of the golf course used to be just bad news for the golfer when the ball goes in. Uh, and now we open the lake for, for swimming, for stand-up paddle. Uh, so we are trying to uh, look at it as a big amount of space that people can uh, have more space between each other and uh, to, to relax. Yeah. Uh, but the number of bookings compared to like three years ago, it's still very small. So people tend to go more to resorts than to city center at this moment. But if we if we go back three years or four years, it's still uh, not good news. No, no. Okay, great. Um, so, Pedro, this slide here, which is an interesting one, because there's a couple of things here that I, I already are kind of catching my eye, but top concerns for hotels this summer. Let's uh, run through some of those. Uh, so we, you know, on our report, we always ask a different question every, and, and we, we ask people, you know, what are your top concerns? And one obviously is to maintain the recovery and sort of the resilience on the direct channel. But I think everything else is sort of very interesting. One is you've all worried about market competitiveness and what the competitors are going to do and are they going to destroy ADR, which actually we're not seeing to date, not, not in a massive way. There are spots where we could say, you know, ADR has has fallen but for instance in miami adr is through the roof right adr mm -hmm. is literally 30 percent above what it was in 2019 in miami so um the other is obviously mass cancellations because this is the, the issue of on the book but i think two things that are very interesting are the whole staff related issue right yeah. one is hiring and training which we and, you know across the board all in all markets it's been very difficult to train and, and hire, and then sort of the impact of potentially not hiring well or not training them well enough and getting negative reviews. So that actually, you know, especially in the upscale and in the luxury markets, that people are worried that if they're not going to get the level of service that typically people are used to, that actually they're going to be there's going to be a long term backlash of these uh, of these days over the course of the summer. So I think it's just these are just interesting interesting piece of data that makes us think about what can we do to to make sure that we perform in the summer it, and it's not only about the economic performance of the hotel it's also about the guest experience 
Mm, mm, absolutely. And, and Joao, are you also finding in Portugal, um, or for basically for all of your properties, are you having um, challenges as well with with hiring of staff when you need them? Because that seems to be a common theme as well across uh, the industry, pretty much globally, I think, at this stage. Yeah. It's it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge, definitely. Uh, we when we first noticed that a lot of people uh, were at home, we thought it would be easy. Uh, when we recover to get uh, high, more staff, uh, but uh, it hasn't been hasn't been easy, and we we mm. noticed this all, all over Portugal. Yeah, yeah. What about yourself, Pedro? Are you also seeing that for for uh, what? Well. Uh, not just yourself, but also from those that you're talking to. Is that a common? From, from those that we're talking to, I think that's probably the, one of the biggest concerns that we see. Especially, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a lot of people went uh, when sort of the, in the early summer and opened their properties, and they hired a bunch of people, and then some of them actually sent them back home, and now it's really difficult, right? I think there's just a lot of people leaving the industry. I think in the U.S., what we're seeing is we're going to we're, we're seeing tremendous up pressure on salaries, um, you know. And by the way, it's not only hotels; it's hotels and restaurants, uh, yeah. where basically, you know, there was there was so massive packages put in place to support unemployment and layoffs and furloughs and so on that now we're going to have a hard time, you know, getting people that make you know not a lot of money by the hour back into hotels and restaurants. So, so I, we're worried about that, but I think also my biggest concern in terms of sort of the long-term um, um, impact of this is that if people have, have difficulty hiring, then, you know, are they going to have this, you know, negative reviews? And, and if you think about the opportunity that it open up, opens up is what sort of technology can we then deploy to make, you know, either staff more productive or, you know, um, that's that's always because I'm a tech guy, right? I always think about could tech help in some way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think technology can and should help in, in a way for sure, especially through these changes. I think the challenge that we're, we're going to face as an industry now is is really identifying where to best apply that uh, technology and, and in what technology to invest in because obviously you know funding is something that has to be uh, very closely monitored or, or spending uh, needs to be very closely monitored um, okay great before we move on there's another question here um, and I apologize in advance because I will not get this correct and perhaps uh, Pedro or Joao can correct my pronunciation but Nuno Merino Alfonso has asked how do you feel the average price adjustment will occur right now you have a price war with prices very squeezed and that bring the different categories of hotels closer together so Pedro would you like to start with that one I, I certainly can uh, in the sense of uh, both from a sentiment perspective, if you look here, um, we ask our hoteliers, uh, you know, do you expect ADR to increase or decrease? And, and the sentiment is still that ADR is on the up. So I, I, we don't see it from a sentiment in general of our population, and we're not seeing it either in the results. So the bookings we're getting are not necessarily for lower ADR than 2020. So I, I would ask, you know, Nunu, if you can give us a little bit more information about what kind of price war and what kind yeah. of properties are driving this price decline, because we're not seeing it in general in our system, uh, yeah. which is curious. So, yeah, I was curious to see that as well, because uh, I, 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 it's the first, honestly, it's the first I've heard of a price war. So Nuno, if you could give us a little bit more context and background on that, that'd be and maybe really, really well, helpful. Maybe, maybe do you see this sort of price war going on? I, I really understand where Nuno is coming from, because uh -huh. at this at this precise moment, we don't feel there is a war, uh, but there is a huge risk of uh, that happening. Uh, at this moment, maybe because most of the hotels are just starting, uh, reopening, and because hotels had support from the government uh, with the, uh, and from European Union, we, we had some, some financial support. At the moment, we are not feeling, but once this support uh, goes, uh, we don't have it anymore, and all season comes, that is not very far. Uh, I mean, like uh, November is coming very soon. 
November, yeah. December, January, February, uh, there's a big risk that this this will happen. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a fair that's a fair uh, point, which is you know we've we've had a sort of an abnormal buoyancy in from a financial perspective because of all these government support measures, and uh, and and also the postponement of, of loan payments and loan repayments exactly. and all yeah, this yeah, stuff. Definitely. And once that is gone. Um, the cash crunch is going to come and people may start doing uh, silly things in terms of pricing. So, so I wonder, um, I wonder if that's where we're going up until now, we haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. We, we, yeah, okay. we did notice because uh, this was, we had time to, to experiment in a very small scale because number of bookings were very small. But the experiments we were making increasing, decreasing price, when we decreased the number of bookings, did not increase so exactly so it, it didn't work so may also might be another reason yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and, and actually i i agree with that is that if there's no demand pricing won't change and and i think a lot of people that you know looking at this right where really you know the, the domestic market has been driving a lot of traffic and also the sentiment is that it's probably more important again I was surprised, you know, through 2020 and through now that actually domestic people, which were probably not so willing to part with lots of money for a hotel night in their own countries, they're willing to do so now. And and hopefully that's going to be a change for the future where people, you know, that if they went to New York, they would, you know, pay 400 euros for, for a hotel night, but not in Germany. And now I think people are willing to do that as long as the experience is there. So, yeah. so hopefully, you know, that's going to drive also a little bit better um, uh, overall ADR. I don't know. I think the other thing that's interesting here, and I, I don't know if you, want, if, if, you, if, you, if you agree with this, but I'm starting to be very bullish on, on business travel, actually. I have already two business uh, uh, meeting or two business uh, uh, travels booked for September myself, personally, right? Um, but I'm starting to see some very interesting indications from the U.S. market of, of people getting back on the road. And obviously, there's always the essential travelers. Um, but I think people are, are dying to get back on the road. Uh, and, you know, informally talking to hoteliers, I feel that that's coming back. I think that there's a section of the population that's still afraid and is not going to travel. But there's a significant amount of people that are dying to get back on the road and meet face to face. So. So I'm hopeful that for the for the fall we're going to start to see uh, business travel again. We've seen consistently month over month growth on GDS um, this year, um, and that's sort of indicating that you know maybe there's something uh, brewing there for for the fall. Absolutely. In the talking about different segments, we feel uh, okay. Summer leisure took off a little bit, not. Uh, yeah. what we expected as we talked earlier and then second one golfers uh, golfers have been very brave they were the first to book and uh, when the pandemic started they didn't want to leave the resorts and now they already booked big time for october so all the resorts in portugal spain south of europe we've got lots of bookings for october but they can easily cancel uh, one email, yeah. 10 emails, we've got a good month going to a very, very bad month. So golfers, if nothing happened, will be the second ones to, to return. And then we feel small groups and big groups after. I think uh, I don't believe big groups booking for the beginning of next year. Maybe this second half of next year will have big groups. Okay. Excellent. Okay. We have another question coming in from Michael Madison. Michael, thanks so much for joining and for for the question. He says that in many markets, hotels have resisted the instinct to reduce rates. So he's basically saying, what is the point if there is not much demand? Joao, what would you think? Um, We we also need to, to be careful because if our product, certain resort is worth something, uh, and there's no demand, we don't want to reduce value from our proposal. Uh, price is just one point of the whole marketing of the whole product. 
so we would attract clients that are not uh, our normal clients so we need to take a bigger perspective and maybe wait a little bit yeah okay and uh, Pedro you just changed slides there as well as I brought that up is there is this slide something you wanted to reference there no not, not really it's, it was just following the the conversation about business travel and and that there's you know the expectation is that things are going to improve dramatically in the first quarter of 2022, which I think is what what Juan is sort of saying is saying is that you know it's going to be 2022 before we we see any significant uh, volume from say uh, events or 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 business travel. I, I'd like to share one more thing, which I, mm -hmm. I just took a screenshot from. Uh, this is uh, in euros, but actually. Um, it looks very similar in, uh, in, in, in U.S. dollars. It's actually a little bit better. And you can see here, you know, the average booking uh, uh, ADR on, on our platform. And you can see that um, actually through the summer of 2020, we had a really good summer from an ADR perspective. This year, we're a little bit below 2020, but we're still above uh, 2019. So... So I, I am hopeful that, you know, we're going to keep the ADR line. And, and as Michael said, you know, if there's not a lot of demand, there's no point in, in, in dropping price because nobody's going to show up. It's not the price that's the distinctive uh, reason for traveling or not traveling. So, so I, think, I, I think we're going to be able to hold the line there. Okay. Which, I mean, if you think about it as well, I mean, when, when this whole thing started and we started having this conversation, in, in many ways, we, we did say that we don't really think things are going to come back to anywhere near normal until around 2022 anyway, or even 23. So in many ways, this has been a drawn out process for us all. But I think also it's not, it's not uh, we've, 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 we've said it before. I think we are on track with our predictions is what I'm trying to get yeah. at. Would you agree? I, I I, I, at least from our perspective, we've always been sort of on the conservative side. So we yeah. never really embarked. I, I remember that actually in, we did a face-to-face -face event in May and everybody was very, very bullish, sort of like Juan was saying earlier, hopeful that, you know, the summer is going to, we're going to make up in the summer everything we lost in the pandemic. And, 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 and I, I remember distinctly saying we should be more cautious because this thing is not, you know, a done deal yet. Um, so in that sense, I think, for, at least from our perspective, we've been sort of meeting expectations because we've been very conservative. Um, I, I, but I, I would say I'm, I'm also very disappointed at what happened in June, honestly, because May yeah. was really pointing in the right direction. And then June really threw a really wet blanket on, on the expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, we are coming up towards the end of the hour. So I have uh, one uh, other question that's uh, a kind of a more of a, I guess, a personal one, uh, Joao, for you and also perhaps for Pedro as well. But, you know, as you know, we're talking about life coming back to normal and we are hoping we're ever optimistic about normality returning, which everyone is, of course. Um, what what are you looking forward to um, the most in a post pandemic world? So you know when it comes to what you're you're offering the services that Onria does, what is it that you're actually really looking forward to uh, from from the hop, the operational side of things as a hotelier? Um, mainly, uh, so social distancing became becoming an old word. Yeah. Uh, uh, hanging people, not Pedro, but uh, other people. <laughs> <laughs> and to have normal room, rules at the hotel, like uh, now we have assisted buffet, to have a normal buffet, uh, to have events, a golf tournament that uh, when people uh, play good, they can do a, high, a proper high five or meetings when a speaker speaks very well uh, to have a big ovation, uh, just uh, normal stuff, or to have a concert that we can have full capacity, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So essentially everything pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, fair enough. Okay, great. Also, everyone, in just uh, just another quick reminder: don't forget to uh, you can download the, um, the the latest edition of the report, um, and Melissa can throw the the link again into the chat session. So, if you'd like to see the report in more detail and uh, have a read through it, it is available for you. And also, as hoteliers, please um, uh, don't forget we would love to have your contribution to uh, the information that's compiled in this report. So, please um, uh, access the link and. and and contribute to the data if you're willing to do that as well. That would also be very helpful. Uh, and Melissa can pop the link back in there again. Um, all right. So I think um, unless anyone has any other further questions, is there anything, Pedro, that you'd like to also add to this before we I, wrap I'd everything like, up? Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to add a, you know, a note of, of hope, right? So Google introduced the Google free booking tool back in, I don't remember, you know, February, March, around that time frame, right? Um, and we saw actually a big, uh, a big spike in interest in meta search from hoteliers back then. Um, that seemed to have declined in the uh, in the in the survey, but actually we're seeing great results. So uh, I was very, very um, um, how can I say this skeptical about you know the whole that that the, the the free bookings were so hidden inside the customer journey uh, on the on, on the Google website that I thought it was not going to generate any volume. And actually it is a lift. It doesn't, you know, change things dramatically, but, but, but it does provide a lift. So I would encourage people to participate in the Google free booking uh, campaign, because uh, I think uh, it was Nunu that said, you know, um, there's uh, a lot of these bookings are happening last minute. So if you're in the last minute outlets like Google, where somebody's on their mobile phone, they're ser searching for something. And if you're there, you're going to get that booking. And if you're not there, you're not going to get it. So, so I, I do believe that we need to think about the mobile experience. And I think meta search in that sense with the, with the Google program can help. Yeah, definitely. And Joao, any other uh, final thoughts and comments from your side, from the, the operator side? No, just to say thank you for the opportunity. It was great to uh, speak with you guys. Uh, oh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're always thrilled to have hoteliers in these conversations. That's the, the, the whole point of it. So it's great to have you. So actually, we should be thanking you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right well then i think what we'll do is wrap this up unless anyone has any further comments and there's no other questions coming through um so until next time i think we'll say goodbye and everyone thanks so much for joining us and until next time it's uh bye for now well, have a nice uh have a nice break <laughs> see you guys yeah everybody you too thank you bye-bye all right <laughs>